You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, I wish I could say there was a theme to tell you what was going on today, but uh, there isn't. There's just a lot of a lot of news, and um, because I tend to go on tirades, I have no idea how far we're even going to get, but uh, we'll start ripping through some of this. A little bit of talk about Balaga, Jimmy Graham, Zadarius, stuff going on around the league. Lions news, Bears news again. I don't know how far we're going to get, but um, that's what's on the docket, man. Whoa, man, whatever. Either way, please make sure you are in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. Make sure you like the Packernet Podcast Facebook page. If you'd like to support the show, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. I would very much appreciate your support. Again, not only does it go to pay for the massive amount of things that I pay for to be able to bring insights and information but it's somewhat of validation in a way you're heading in the right direction is what that says so consider it again you can jump in for as little as a dollar a month i'm talking one 20 piece nugget large fry large drink is just about going to cover it for the year so just consider it please thank you very much otherwise a rating and review for the podcast would be greatly appreciated if you're an apple user that's going to be the easiest way to do it If not, Stitcher is really the only one else that I'm aware of. Otherwise, just subscribing on Spotify would be greatly helpful. Because as I've said, Spotify is becoming kind of a giant in the podcasting world. And I want them to like me. Anyways, why don't we take our break and we'll dive into all this juicy goodness. Ladies and gentlemen... Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So I guess I want to start with Brian Balaga. Um, You know, as the days tick on, it just seems less and less likely that he's going to get signed. I'm not saying he's not going to, but generally when we talk about the Packers and giving not just offensive linemen, pretty much anybody a third contract, but but especially offensive linemen, and we, we come to the point where we say, you know, we just can't survive without them, the Packers never kind of look at it that way. We have let guys walk when we feel like we can't survive without this person several times, and technically we survived. It's never quite as dire as we think it is, and so just because we've been down this road so many times, 
and add in on top of that the article from The Athletic in which essentially Brian Balaga was saying they haven't even started considering talking to me or my agent. There's been nothing. Now, that's common across the league. We've heard several players say, look, our, the, the team hasn't even reached I mean, Dak Prescott, he's going to play in Dallas. He hasn't received a single phone call from anybody in Dallas. So a lot of this has to do with the CBA issue and not knowing what we got going forward. The Packers also might be looking at Jared Valdir, which I don't super understand that other than he's cheaper, but he's not as good as Brian Balaga, and he's as old. I think he's actually older than Brian Balaga. So in terms of solving a problem, it doesn't solve anything. Brian Balaga came out and said he wants to play for like three, three or four more years, I think. Valdir retired last year. So, I mean, if we're talk, talking about long-term security not that I think Brian Balaga is long-term but I mean it just feels like they're trying to paint themselves into a corner by not re-signing Brian Balaga in a in a way in which they have no choice but to draft a tackle in the first round and I absolutely despise that I despise that with a passion It, 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 it pulls you away from best player available and forces you to do something that you shouldn't the odds that the best player available at pick 30 is going to be a tackle is pretty low. Even in a, at, a, at a time, I mean, if we were picking in the top 10, fine. Let Balaga walk and we'll take a tackle. There's going to be somebody that's there, but we're picking at 30. All these top tackles are gone. So, so the idea that, well, there's a lot of tackles in this class, so there's a better than, than average, no, not necessarily. The good ones will be gone. So now we're talking about back of the first, basically second round pick type players. There's no telling who's going to be at the top of the board. So again, I, I get it. That, that's my hesitation. He's a very good player. He wants to keep playing. He wants to stay in Green Bay. We can technically afford him, although he's not cheap, especially if there's a great chance at the CBA, the, the uh, salary cap is about to go up in the next few years. If we give him eight, nine, ten million million, which is the average, not what we're actually going to pay him this year, I mean, it's just it's not that big of a deal to me. But again, the Packers just don't see the value in it. They let guys walk all the time. Sitton, I know, was a little bit of a different situation, but we let Sitton walk, we let Lang walk, we let Treader go. Um, to be completely honest, though, Ted Thompson got it completely wrong along the offensive line in which he never wanted to re-sign anybody, and the offensive line actually did suffer quite a bit. We still, I mean, we, we had it where this was arguably the best offensive line in football, and we had starters as backups. We got rid of our starting offensive line, and we got rid of several of our backups, like J.C. Treader. Just let him walk because we didn't want to pay him. And we're still at a point now where we have no depth whatsoever. Any injury is automatically catastrophic. And we, we have never really made any effort outside of Jason Spriggs to replenish any of this, other than some garbage swings in the 6th and 7th round at, at random players. And, 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 and by the way, and I, I want to do this in a separate episode, I started working on this already, I actually technically finished, but I want to see if I want to go more in depth on it, looking at why you can't just look at this year's needs for things to replace. Because every year it's like, oh, we need a linebacker. We don't need offensive line. We technically have offensive line. The problem is eventually you get to a point where you're really in a lot of trouble and you're wondering why we never had a backup plan for this. And the reason is because it was never a super pressing need up until the moment in which we're about to lose somebody in free agency. You know, why might the Packers take a corner? We don't need a corner. We got corners. Yeah, we do today, maybe. What do we need a running back for? We got Aaron Jones. For what, one more year? And then next year it ends up being a really weak running back class? I don't know that. I'm just saying. And then everyone flips out because there were a billion great running backs and we didn't touch one. And now we got ourselves into a bind. And I'm not completely coming down on the Packers and and Gutekunst and Thompson or whatever because... That's sort of the problem. That's what I want to lay out when I do that episode, whenever that is, is that you only get roughly seven picks, and you can only expect maybe two or three to be really good football players. The idea that you get seven picks and you can expect seven of them to contribute is nonsense. Maybe four play, but the odds that more than two or three are going to be any good? If you get three good players out of a draft class, that's an amazing draft. I mean, amazing. And so you lay it out, this is what I've already done, into the future, at what point are we going to need to replace this person? Probably. And you look at these clusters and you say, if we don't start replacing these now, we're going to come up to, for example, 2024, when we're going to lose a bunch of key players, including our quarterback, probably, and a bunch of other guys that we, you know, you look at and just say, this team is going to take a massive step back without this player. If we haven't started replacing them in 
2020, 2021, 2022. We're not going to have enough picks in 2024 to replace everybody. So this is why it's important, and this is also why it's not ridiculous to start talking about should we draft a quarterback. It doesn't have to be now, but we can't keep just kicking the can down the road and saying, no, we don't need it now. We need to give him weapons. Okay, well then 2023, 24, 25, whenever he goes away, that year comes, and what, we're just going to magically snap our fingers and get an elite quarterback? What if there isn't one? What if there's only going to be one that's any good and he's sort of mediocre and he's going to go with the first pick and we pick at pick 32? There's never a guarantee that you're going to, and this is why best player available makes so much sense. There's never a guarantee that you're ever going to get a good player at that position. So if your board, if your scouts, if your scouting ability tells you that this guy is a legitimate starter, you take him. You don't just go down the list because, well, we need this. We need a second wide receiver this year more than we need this guy that we think could be literally, literally a Pro Bowl caliber player. Because in two years, the, the Pro Bowl player at that position is going to be a position of need that you didn't take because you took a second wide receiver because you thought that was the most important need at that time. And because it's the most important, we just have to, to take it in the first round. So we're going to reach on a second round guy who's a wide receiver rather than this Pro Bowl safety or whatever. No, you take great players when you have the opportunity to take great players because within the next two to three years, you can guarantee that position is going to be a position of need. It's nearly impossible that there's not going to be a time in which any one position, or there, there, there is not going to be a time in which one position is locked up for like four or five years. Just completely, we never have a need there. That's not going to happen. Maybe quarterback. Okay, fine. Punter, kicker. Guy, positions in which there's one guy and he can play for a really long time. Fine, I'll, I'll give you that. But you start talking about defensive line, edge, linebacker, corner, safety, Anywhere along the offensive line, generally speaking, especially when we talk about depth, running back, because giving even second contracts is kind of, these are things you just want to continually replace, continually get talent. You're never going to be upset like, oh man, we got this guy who's super, Rashawn Gary is a perfect example. The guy was on the bench almost all year. Do you think the Packers care? I don't think they care even a little bit. But again, my, my contention is to just be a coward and say, let's please just re-sign him. And, and look, if we re-sign him and the best player available is a tackle, take a tackle. Because Balaga is not going to play for more than maybe two years anyways. And he's probably going to get hurt in that two-year stretch. So we're going to need someone to back him up. Just give the guy a contract, please. And, I, and again, I know Vel... No, no, get rid of him and get Valdir. First of all, there's a huge market for Jared Valdir right now. A lot of guys want him. There's no guarantee we're going to get him. And again, he doesn't solve anything that Balaga doesn't solve other than being cheaper, maybe. Because again, there's a huge market for Valdir. I have no idea what the market is for Balaga. For all I know, Valdir is going to get paid more than Balaga. When you got five teams competing for Valdir and you got Balaga just sitting there waiting, I mean, I'm sure somebody would sign Balaga, but I don't know that Valdir is necessarily going to be cheaper. I just, I don't super understand the overexcitement for Jared Valdir. He is not a better football player. He's not younger. I don't even necessarily know that he's less injury prone. He's played less than Balaga has the last two years. I mean, if that's what we want to do, fine. I I just, I don't understand. And I I honestly think that would be terrible for the locker room to not offer Brian Balaga, a guy who is very liked in the locker room, a contract and replacing him with a guy that's even older. Balaga's only 30 years old. We know tackles can play till they're 35-ish, some of these guys. Jared Valdir is 32 years old. He's two years older. I just, I don't know, man. I really hope this is just radio silence until the CBA thing comes through and then they just come flying in like, here's the offer, and it gets signed, and it's like, what are you guys talking about? Of course we're going to resign him. You guys are dumb. But, you know, again, if we don't sign Balaga and we don't sign Valdir and there's not some other weird thing that happens, either a trade or something, we have to draft a tackle. We just have to. As much as I've been talking about maybe Spriggs isn't as bad as we thought, I, 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 you know, I don't trust him. I don't mind keeping him around, you know, behind Balaga and trying him out to see if maybe he has taken a step, maybe he has turned a corner. I don't want to just be like, guess what, you're up. Here's a couple million bucks. You're the tackle now. I also don't want to not take a tackle in the first round if we don't have a tackle because, again, as I laid out, Look at the best tackles in football. Almost every single one is a first-round tackle. Very rarely, if ever, does a talented tackle slip past the first round. David Bakhtiari is beyond the exception. Way beyond the exception. I mean, a second-round tackle is super rare. Third, fourth, beyond, beyond, beyond rare. 
And if you say, well, there's a lot of tackles, so maybe they'll slip into the second. Yeah, late second. I'm uh, sorry, early second, late first, which is where our first pick is. Counting on some of these elite, great, can't, you know, can't miss tackles to slide to the second, late second round. No, that, sorry, no. I mean, you know, it could happen. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that's not a position where you wait. It's like, it's, it's really not very much different than quarterback. Quarterback and tackle are two positions where if you want it, you take it in the first round, end of conversation. And that's my biggest hangout. So we have to take a tackle. And even then, again, a lot of the best tackles are gone. So the odds of us getting, because if you really break it down, first round is where all the tackles are. But the cluster of elite tackles that, are, that were taken in the top 10 is, is ridiculous. That's why I said tackle must be the most easy position to evaluate because teams just don't miss on tackle. The best of the best are usually taken in the top 10. The rest of the best are taken in the first round with a, just a sprinkle outside of that. A lot of them are undrafted free agents or like two of them, which comes for different reasons. You know, there was a guy that played defensive tackle and they switched him or something. Or, you know, I forgot who it was, Lael Collins or somebody that there was a serious allegations that were going through a process. So teams didn't want to touch him until late. And then it got cleared and Dallas just completely cashed in on that. So this isn't something you can mess around with. Well, it's no big deal. We'll 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 pass on Balaga. We'll miss on Valdir. We'll take a wide receiver. Then we'll take a linebacker, and then we'll take a tackle in the third round. Okay, fine. We're not going to have a right tackle. Well, we can slide Billy Turner. Terrible idea. Well, we got Jason Spriggs. Horrible idea. Maybe uh, we could sign a free agent. Right. The only free agents that are available are old. I mean, as old or older than Balaga, and pretty terrible. With the exception of Valdir, who again is as good, maybe a little bit less good, and uh, older, and right on the er verge of retirement. He literally just retired last year. I don't care what he's saying now. Oh, I I feel like I want to play. This guy said that last year. He said he wanted to play. The Patriots picked him up. He went into camp, decided he didn't like doing push-ups anymore, and quit. Granted, that's not exactly what happened. There were some injury concerns that kind of got cleared up, but still, I just don't trust that. This is like Brett Favre. Right? Oh, I definitely want to play. I love this game. This is my passion. And then training camp comes in. I'm not going to training camp, dude. I don't want to put in work. That's hard. I'm not doing it. You know what? I don't even know if I want to play anymore. It's like, Brett, I will smack you right in the forehead. Don't play this game with me. That's. I mean, that's just, I'm not playing that dance with Valdir. But yet, letting Balaga walk, who wants to be a Packer, who wants to play for another several years, has never even flinched in terms of wanting to quit. I mean, just look at Belag. He was built for this, man. This is his life. When he retires, he's going to go work, you know, he's going to go pull a wagon somewhere. He's just going to become a, a mule. This is just his life, being big and mean and pushing and pulling stuff around. You're just going to find him somewhere pushing an F-150 up a hill for no reason whatsoever. This is just what he is, dude. Anyways, I hope I haven't been unclear on where I stand on this. It's just, and that's the thing. That's That's the biggest reason why I feel like they're going to get rid of him. I'm I'm acting entirely out of fear, and the Packers don't do that. They don't act out of fear. If we had a tackle waiting in the wings, there would be no concern whatsoever on letting Balaga walk. It would just feel like the prudent move. As much as we all love Balaga, it would we would just look at it and go, oh yeah, he's gone, 100%. But it's the fear that we don't have one, and again, the Packers don't act on fear. If it's the prudent move, it's what they're going to do, and I just want to... <sighs> we'll want to have faith, but I cannot and I will not. I refuse. I will stomp my foot like a small, irate child. Speaking of moves, though, however, um, something to give us a glimmer of, I don't know, I don't want to act like this is what we need to do, but just to be aware that moves are being done right now. The, uh, the Chargers and the Panthers had a little bit of a trade. The Chargers traded Russell O'Kong to the Carolina Panthers, and in return... The Chargers are getting Trey Turner. So when Gutekunst talks about, you know, looking at all the options, you know, there's more options than just the draft. However, before we get all bent out of shape about this, um, Russell Okung is 32 years old. And although he's a good tackle, had a really down year last year, but he was injured, so that doesn't super count in my mind. I don't know that he's any better than Balaga. So again, the whole issue of we got guys that are older than him, but different and maybe as good, I just, I don't super understand that, especially coming off an injury. That's crazy. And similarly, Trey Turner, 
who apparently has gone to the Pro Bowl five times. I can't imagine why. He's only been in the league since 2014, which is to say he's played six years. So five out of his six years, the guy is not very good. So again, this is sort of the problem. There aren't usually very amazing, awesome options. So for example, if we just run through the list of tackles and say, okay, we want to find somebody that's young and we want to find somebody that maybe could get traded like Ronnie Stanley from the Baltimore Ravens, except nope, they're not going to trade him. We got David Bakhtiari, second best pass blocker, which is what I'm ranking this by because that's what matters. Laramie Tunsil was traded for a first round pick. So there's that. However, is he going to get traded again? No. Here's an option for you. And I don't know that it's necessarily a good option, but let's just talk about it because the, the whole reason I did this was to prove that there are no options. But now that I'm doing it, I want to actually look at it. We'll do one option and then we'll move on. The Falcons left tackle Jake Matthews. Super unlikely he goes anywhere. However, he is counting $16 million against the Falcons cap. $18 million next year, 17 and 16 after that. The, the Falcons have $3 million in cap space, 3, 4, whatever. Now, the problem is they actually lose money because of all the dead money because it's the, at the beginning of their extension. But, I don't know, it's kind of close to an idea, close to an option. Maybe in 2021 we could try to get them. I don't know. So that doesn't super work. I thought we had something there, but not quite. Andrew Whitworth is uh, 38 years old, so that's not going to work. Teron Armstead, definitely not going anywhere for the New Orleans Saints because they're trying to build and not fall apart. Jason Peters is 38 years old, so that's not going to work. Ryan Ramzik, again, Saints, not going anywhere. Anthony Costanzo is older. He's 31, going on 32. Orlando Brown is uh, Baltimore Ravens, still on his rookie contract, so clearly not going anywhere. Anyways, on and on it goes. There's just, there's nothing, man. This is one of the more protected positions. It's like quarterback. You're just not going to let him go. If you're in a salary cap mess, you find some other position to throw away. So there's, there's no other options. I'm sorry. And staying on the subject of going bye-bye, although this isn't really super big news, you never really know what the Packers are going to do, so I guess a slight bit of confirmation. Ian Rappaport tweeted out that, uh, well, I'll just read it, one potential playmaker hitting the market, Packers tight end Jimmy Graham is not expected back in Green Bay, sources say. The move with the 33-year-old former free agent sign, uh, signing is notable, though not a surprise for anyone involved. So I don't, I don't exactly know what that means. It depends what his, who his source is. If his source is, you know, I mean, it's Ian Rappaport. I would have to assume it would have to be like his agent or somebody of note. I'm, I, mean, I don't know if this is more than we already know because, I mean, we know he's not expected back. But again, if this is his agent or, or somebody that maybe has got an official word that, look, we're, we're not really looking to, uh, to bring him back, then, then it's officially official. So I tend to think that I'm, I'm going to go ahead and call this official. And again, I know we all thought that this was already official. I didn't think they were going to bring back Jimmy Graham last year, and they did. So you just never really super know what they're going to do. But uh, for our purposes, we're going to call that an official statement, and Jimmy Graham is officially gone. Anyways, kind of pivoting off of that, I got this question quite a while ago. I don't remember from who or where or whatever. I apologize for that. But the question was essentially, how does this new CBA impact the Zadarius Smith situation with him getting pulled over and uh, in trouble with the law for having marijuana in his car and essentially taking the fall for that. Because remember, supposedly, if this CBA passes, which I think most people expect it to, I don't know why the vote hasn't taken place yet. Really need to get on with it so we can get this flurry of awesome going. But the point is there was supposed to be more leniency on marijuana offenses. There's also supposed to be a middle person between the league and the the commissioner, Roger Goodell. I couldn't think of that name, that title, commissioner. So there's several steps there. In other words, Roger Goodell can't single-handedly come down with an iron fist and just say, "I'm mad at you, so I'm going to throw this random, you know, this is this is what you're getting." And remember, um, Aaron Jones, I think, had gotten a two-game suspension for a similar offense, and so. Here is how the CBA lays it out, supposedly. There's sort of two parts to this. The first part is that it's going to reduce marijuana testing, which isn't really relevant for what we're talking about. But a suspension, I guess, would only come in the event of, in the first part, extreme and repeated disregard of the policy, which does not apply here. It's not in any way that I could think of as being extreme, and it's certainly not repeated. So that doesn't apply. It says, or 
significant violations of applicable law regarding the possession and use of marijuana. So that's sort of the gray area. I can't imagine that that would be put into that category of significant violation of applicable law. It is a violation of law, but is it significant? That's the the, the, the gray area there. But I just think, considering that this is a move in this direction, and I think the NFL wants to get off on a good foot, I, I think one of the things that they could do to demonstrate this would be to simply let this one just go by. Because that's something that I just completely forgot. We might not have Zadarius Smith for a while if he gets suspended for what happened last year. But especially considering he didn't specifically even have it directly on him. It was found in a bag, and he said he would take the fall for it, meaning there's very good reason to believe that that wasn't his. Now, I have a feeling he knew it was in there. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is, you can't necessarily, despite the fact that he said, yeah, I'll, t- I'll take the blame for that, that's on me, there's every reason to believe that he took the fall for the younger guys that were in the car. Again, I'm, I'm not stupid. He absolutely knew what they were going to Chicago for. I'm sure there was lots of drinking and drugs and everything else going on. It's not like this. he was on his way to church and Rashawn Gary snuck weed in the bag and that's how they got in trouble. The whole car stunk. So he's not ignorant to that, but still. You're gonna, if we're going to call this a significant violation and he didn't even necessarily have any on him, we don't know if he had any in his system. For all we know, one of the younger guys was just grabbing a little bit for the ride back and Zadarius had nothing to do with it. So this would be a great opportunity for the league to just simply overlook this and to, to demonstrate that, look, we're, we're going in a different direction here. I would have to think that this violation would be a little bit more along the lines of, you know, maybe distribution or if you have massive quantities that would allude to the idea of wanting to distribute, I really don't know what else would apply for a significant violation, other than, you know, for example, if he was doing like 150 miles an hour, which I think he was speeding, which is the same thing with Aaron Jones, which I don't understand. And I don't want to go down this tirade again, but if you're going to do something illegal, don't speed! I don't I don't get it. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. I, I Again, I in my mind... These things don't add up to a significant violation of applicable law. I mean, the guy got a ticket and got sent on his way, so whatever. We'll have to see. That That's my assumption, and I, and I hope that is the case. Maybe that was going to be the case anyways. You never really know because there was never any really defined rules. It, it just kind of fluctuated. And the NFL is, is a lot like politics, you know. It just kind of goes with whatever. You want to appeal to the people but also have this. and the, the, There's all these pulling factors that everything just changes constantly. But I guess if I had to guess, I would guess that there is not going to be a punishment that comes down for Zadarius. If there is, that's pretty unfortunate. Anyways, why don't we take a quick break and we'll come back and look at a little bit of Lions and Bears news and see where we're at after that. All right, so let's start off with the Detroit Lions. Apparently there was some talk that for the second year in a row, the Detroit Lions are interested in Chris Harris Jr., the corner that formerly played for the Denver Broncos. Very, very good corner, although he is getting older and seemingly seemingly in decline. The reason that I find this the most interesting is because they're planning on moving on from Darius Slay, and there's always a question of why. Now, again, I've said this every time, I think Darius Slay has always been a little bit overrated. He's good, but the idea that he's this lockdown corner, I just, I don't know. I mean, it's not reflected in when we play the Lions. It's never, he's never been a problem. And also, if you just look at what PFF has to say, he's not one of the top corners. He also had a significant dip this year. Now, the question in my mind was, is this sort of a cap issue? In other words, maybe he just wants more money than they're willing to pay him. Or is this just a, look, this isn't working, I just don't necessarily want him. Remember, they've got a new head coach who adopted most of this team, including Slay, who has a different idea of how to play defense, and maybe he's just not a good fit for this team and this scheme. The fact that they want to bring in a older and more expensive corner while still looking to get rid of Slay tells me everything I want to know. It's not his price tag, it's the fact that they don't think he can play. It's also somewhat of an interesting dynamic. Uh, Last year they wanted to get him, but they wanted to trade Slay for Chris Harris, and I'm assuming a little bit more, and Denver just kind of laughed at him like, no, dude, sorry. This year Chris Harris is a free agent, however, so they can simply just go out and buy him. And they do have a decent amount of money, but uh, they're competing with some guys that have a good amount. I mean, the Cowboys currently have a lot of money. We'll see what happens to their money after they get, you know, Amari and Cobb and Dak and all these guys they say they want to keep. But Raiders, Texans, Jets, it's a tough competition. The other interesting aspect about this 
is what does this do for the draft? Assuming we get them, we get them. Listen to me. I apologize for that. That was a horrible thing to say. Assuming the Lions get him, I feel like such a traitor. What would that mean for the draft? Because you could go in a couple different directions. If they get Chris Harris and draft Jeff Okuda, oh my goodness. Which isn't a terrible reason for, for a terrible decision for a couple reasons. Number one, having two lockdown corners is never a bad decision. The fact that it's hardly ever even pursued is really surprising, other than the fact that it's probably hard to get and expensive. But Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Boye, that one year they were both like the number one and two corners, which isn't exactly how that played out, but they were both top ten. I mean, nobody would have looked at that and said, eh, you don't really need that. Beyond that, Chris Harris is a short-term solution. He's not going to be there forever. So you get Jeff Okuda, who's going to stick around for a long time. But in the meantime, you've got the best cornerback duo, maybe, possibly, if Chris Harris isn't completely falling apart, and if Jeff Okuda is any bit as good as people say they are, and if he can play well with the Lions, because, you know, it's the Lions. and Maybe sometimes people go there and don't play as well as they possibly could, as has been evidenced by literally everybody on that team. But that would be the thought process. The other way to look at it is, if they get Chris Harris, they could simply say we've got, especially if we're looking at a coach and a GM that are trying to keep their job. In other words, we're just focused on being really good this year. I don't really care about the future. We could say Chris Harris is the corner we need, so we can skip on Okuda and either draft a Derek Brown and get a really good defensive lineman who can play the run and be a good pass rusher, and we have Chris Harris at corner, and of course our offense is going to be really good if we can keep our quarterback healthy and blah, 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 or possibly be more inclined to trade back because that would be Obviously, a lot of teams want to trade up. Miami probably wants to trade up. Teams want to trade up in front of Miami to be able to get Tua. But if they did do a trade with Miami, they only move back two spots. They could probably still get Derrick Brown and get an additional first-round pick. The only thing that you'd worry about if we trade back is that we're going to lose Jeff Okuda. If you do this, though, you maybe don't super care about it as much, and you get Derrick Brown, possibly Jeff Okuda if he falls, because you figure number three is going to be Miami who takes two of us, or really there's just number four, who's the Giants, who are they going to take? They could take Derrick Brown, very good chance they take an offensive tackle, meaning you could still get him anyways. But the point is you get whoever's there and then you get an additional pick, which I don't know why you wouldn't do that anyways when you're the Lions and you're about to get fired. Just stack up on picks. Hope that somebody hits. But but that would be the interesting dynamic Because everybody right now, or at least a lot of people, most people are saying Jeff Okuda to the Lions. If you get Chris Harris, I still think that's the prudent move. If he is as good as everyone seems to think he is, that's probably still your best bet, considering the importance of the position and him having the potential to be a genuinely genuine lockdown corner. And I just trust that maybe a little bit more than I would trust a defensive tackle. We haven't seen a lot of these defensive tackles pan out as much as everybody says they will. You know, occasionally you get an Aaron Donald, but more often than not, you end up with, I don't know, just, geez, go down the list. Big, strong, scary, dominant guys that just don't pan out. So, I don't know, it'll be interesting. I would guess that it's they're not going to end up getting Chris Harris, but if they did, I'm still not super worried. He had by far his worst year of his entire career in 2019, and it had nothing to do with injuries. He played the entire season. I mean, if you go by grades, not including his rookie year, 90, 82, 92, 78, 90, 79, 85, and then 69. If you go by NFL passer rating, 66, 64, 46, 89, 68, 76, 64 this year, 109.4. Had his lowest amount of interceptions since uh, his rookie year with one pick. Second most yards he's ever given up, 672. Second highest reception percentage since his rookie year, 69% of the times he was targeted it was caught lowest amount of stops that he's had in his career and all this while having a very large amount of coverage snaps it was the most amount of snaps he's had since 2016 so that would uh, account for more yards but it also should account for more pass breakups you know more interceptions things like that and that just wasn't the case in fact if you go by on a week by week basis uh, he had one game where he was an elite corner, and that was Week 6 against Tennessee in 91. Second highest game he played was Week 8 against Indy. His grade was a 75. Just looking at his coverage grades, he had 4 over 70. He had 7 games that were under 60, and 60 is average. So he had more games where he was below average than above average. And the guy, I mean, the guy's 30 years old. He's going to be 31 this year. So it's not super crazy to think that this five foot ten, you know, 195, 100. 200 pound guy is starting to fall off you figure a guy like that it's it's all about speed and twitch if you're 5'10 and you're going to dominate it's it's all that athleticism 
And the fact that some of that might be falling off at age 30 or 31. And again, the idea that he's going to get a huge bounce back year when he goes to Detroit away from Vic Fangio. I mean, give me a break. It could happen. Again, it might just be a scheme thing. Maybe Vic Fangio, you know, he, Chris Harris is more he wants to play man coverage and Fangio wants him to play in his zone. Maybe he goes to Detroit, comes back to being a lockdown guy and can handle his business. I just, I would really be shocked that age 31, he gets a big bounce back year playing for Detroit. I, whatever. And again, I, for that reason, I wouldn't mind them actually doing it because it's going to cost them a lot of money. And I'm all about our division rivals paying a lot of, way overpaying for guys because that's how your team deteriorates. Cap efficiency is a massively important thing. Paying less than what a player is worth, which largely that's rookies we're talking about, is really, really important. Not paying more than what they're... If you pay what they're worth, that's fine. But in general, you should have a lot of cap space or be a really good team. There's a lot of really bad teams that have a lot of cap space because you're paying, essentially, for the talent that you have. The the, the thing that I'm in love with about the Bears and, and soon-to-be the Vikings is the fact that they're not that good and they have no money. The Bears have no money and they're bad because they're so wildly inefficient with their cap money. If there was cost per talent, if that was like a thing, which technically it, it can be, and I think it was uh, over the cap that does that based on PFF grade, and we've already talked about this, they're wildly inefficient. But, I mean, really think about it. If, if every single team paid exactly what every player was worth, that would mean the, the better your team is, the less money you have. The worse your team is, the more money you have because you're paying exactly what the talent you have is worth. Your goal is to be right at that line or better, more efficient, which again is why the draft is so ridiculously important because it makes you more efficient where you have more money than you should because you have more talent than the money you're spending on a dollar per talent basis or whatever. And so anytime there's talk about the Detroit, you know, and, and I think most fans hear Detroit might get Chris Harris and go, oh no, because it's they strictly think about good player on a team I don't like. I look at that and say that's exciting because they're going to pay Chris Harris way more than they should. Even if he's pretty good, as a whole, that hurts your team. And and free agency in general is inefficient. Now, you can correct that. It's not like the Packers made the worst mistake in the world because, again, in the long term, Zadarius and Preston and these guys, they're, they're going to be under the whatever the thing is, dollar per how good you are me- metric because the salary cap goes up and they're – pay is relatively static relative to how much it's about to go up so even those guys are going to be underpaid at some point that's what usually happens to players quarterbacks Aaron Rodgers has been underpaid for most of his career despite the fact that when he signs his contracts it's it's like a doomsday how could you possibly pay a guy this much but I'm always on board with the Bears the Vikings and the Lions overpaying guys because in over the 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 entirety of your roster it's going to mean you're a lesser talented team Maybe at that one position you're better. At corner you're going to be better with Chris Harris than without him. But what does that mean everywhere else? You know, again, look at the Bears and how they got to purge people. Look at the Jaguars and how they have to purge. They don't want to get rid of these guys. They have to. Look at the Vikings and how they're going to lose out on players that they that are absolutely top tier players because they wildly overpaid for mediocre linebackers because they decided to give massive raises to wide receivers when they don't have to. So I'm all for it. I hope the Lions end up getting Chris Harris. You know, it, it, it might make them a little bit more competitive, which maybe I shouldn't be rooting for because we're, we're right on the verge of losing to the Lions, which actually is something I want to look at. I want to know why that's happening. I've kind of formed a theory insofar as why the San Francisco 49ers and the Eagles gave us such a hard time. The Chargers, I mean, I'm you know, that was kind of fluky in my mind, and obviously it was the offensive line playing like garbage up against a very good defensive line. But the why do the Lions give us such a hard time? I don't know. I, want, I need to look at that because that's, that's interesting to me. It's the exact opposite situation of the Vikings. If you just look on paper, most people think the Vikings are a much better team, especially Green Bay going into Minnesota. That's just a, That should be a slaughter. The Vikings don't lose at home, et cetera, et cetera. We walk in and just, just smoke them. That was, that's, the, the Vikings are, are one of the better teams that we face, and it's one of the easiest teams that we go up against in terms of just looking at how easy it is to beat them. It's just a weird matchup thing. But the Lions are the exact opposite. They're the laughing stock of the league. But, man, I, I, it's it's down to the wire every single time, even without their quarterback, which is just baffling to me. So I, I want to figure that out. Anyways, there is some talk about the Jaguars also moving on from Foles. I'm pivoting now. 
There was also some talk later on that actually they're not interested in trading Foles, but that doesn't, you know, like a lot of these other things, it doesn't mean teams aren't calling and offering and that they won't listen. The biggest reason I find this interesting is because Nick Foles has to be added to the conversation of the Bears finding a veteran. Now, Andy Dalton has been a big name to the Chicago Bears for a while. As I said, I'm all on board with that because essentially they're going to have to lose one of their second-round picks. They already don't have a first. Having two seconds makes them a little bit more dangerous. And again, I don't think Pace is terrible in terms of drafting. He's just a dummy because he gives all his draft picks away. And so he hasn't been able to rebuild this team and it's slowly eroding, etc., etc. Them having two first-round picks, they could technically trade those in to move up into the first and have a first-round pick, but then they lose a second, whatever. But I'm all on board with that. Now, this hasn't been directly talked about, but I think it makes a lot of sense. If, if A lot of people are talking about uh, Mr. Bill Lazor and how it makes sense that Dalton would go to the Bears because Lazor is now a Chicago Bear. However, if you look at Nick Foles, there's even more connection. Not only has he also worked with Lazor, which just makes me think of American Gladiators. Remember that show? These old jacked up guys pumped up on roids just smoking you right in the mouth with this foam, I don't know, thing. That was a great show. That was a fantastic show. But there literally was a guy named Laser, so that's that's hilarious. As well as Hawk, Turbo, Nitro, Diesel. Anyways, he was with the Eagles in 2013, which is when uh, Bill Laser was there. I think it's Bill. But he was also with DiFilippo last year. DiFilippo was with the Jaguars last year. He went over to be with the Bears as the new quarterback coach. So Foles' quarterback coach went to the Bears, so you got that. But not only that... He's played with Matt Nagy for two different teams. He was with Matt Nagy when he was with the Chiefs. He was with Matt Nagy when he was with the Eagles. So there's three guys on the Bears staff that have worked with Nick Foles in the past. Now, that doesn't mean that they all want him and want to bring him over, and that's just a great fit. So here's the thing with that, because I had gotten a message, and it even dawned on me that Foles is probably the best option of you know, Dalton or even Keenum, who's also being talked to about as being an option for the Bears. Foles is probably the best quarterback. But I had gotten a message yesterday saying, what if they get Foles? Could that possibly make them contenders? Here's the problem I think the Bears are making if they do this. The Jaguars tried to relive what the Eagles did with Foles. The Eagles and the Jaguars essentially did the same thing. They were in this arms race. They went out and spent bajillions of dollars stacking up on defensive players. The difference between the Jaguars and the Eagles is that the Eagles had Foles as their quarterback, which technically they had Wentz, but he got hurt and Foles came in, and the Jaguars had Blake Bortles. So when it was all said and done, what happened? Well, the Eagles couldn't pay Wentz and Foles, so they had to let Foles walk, and so the Jaguars decided they wanted him because they wanted that same success. We did the same thing. We, we got the same plan. We just didn't have the quarterback. Let's go pay for the quarterback that took this team to the Super Bowl. The problem was they were a year too late. They did it when their team was in decline, their defense was in decline, their offense was in decline, everything was going in the wrong direction, so having Foles did nothing for them. Not to mention Minshew came in, but even that was no good. The the bottom line is they had their window and the window closed. The Bears would be making the same mistake. I'm not saying they shouldn't get Foles, but if the idea is if we just have Foles and we pair them with this great defense, we're just going to win a Super Bowl. That, I think, would have been true if they had done this in 2018. If they had gotten Foles as a backup, which wasn't an option in 2018, but if, and had decided to give up on Trubisky, I think there's a very good chance that Foles could have taken them that extra step. The fact of the matter is, however, that day is past. This is not a team that is a subpar quarterback away from simply winning a Super Bowl. If Trubisky is terrible, Foles is meh. And Dalton and Keenum are just kind of eh. So you got meh, you got eh, and you got ugh. That's the Bears' options. And I still don't think meh is going to get them there. Now, I know the, the general consensus is, yeah, but that defense is still really good. The defense is good, but it's not even anywhere close to 2018, as I've said a thousand times. That was an anomaly. That was a weird, random thing that happened only because Vic Fangio just got this thing perfectly tuned. They had a safety that was graded as the best safety in football who is not that good. He's good. He's not the number one safety in football. He's not elite. He is a, I think, fourth round safety who is a great value. It was a great draft pick to get in the fourth round. Kudos to the Bears. Kudos to the Pace for for Pace. To Pace for drafting him. He's not that good. Akeem Hicks, wildly overrated. Very good football player. 
wildly overrated. He had one good year in 2018 in which he was just an absolute freak. He was an anomaly. I said he would regress, and he did. I said their safety would regress, and he did. Beyond that, Prince of Mukamura and Kyle Fuller were both graded as top 10 corners in that draft. Prince of Mukamura is about to go bye-bye. Kyle Fuller was only good because of the scheme and because of how good the pass rush was and the safeties were. The whole scheme has changed. He's got to play press man. He's no good at it. He's not even a good corner anymore. So they don't have good corners. They've got one good safety. They've got, uh, they're have got. they about to lose Kwiatkowski. Roquan Smith has not taken a step and is still a pretty terrible uh, linebacker. They might be losing several linebackers and possibly some safeties. Hakeem Hicks is is still good, not great, and getting a year older. They don't have any other options up front outside of Khalil. The, the defense is Khalil Mack, and it's going to be, I believe, worse than last year. Because they're, it, it's the same as last year, but they're losing pieces. And they don't have the money to really replenish anything, and they don't have a lot of draft picks to replenish anything, especially if they use a second-round pick to get a quarterback. And by the way, on his current contract, Nick Foles costs about $15 million, which the Bears cannot afford. The only way they could possibly get him is to get him and then offer him a contract, which would be the most laughable thing in the history of the universe. They would have to trade a second-round pick to get him. Maybe it would be less because he's so expensive. Whatever. And then we'd have to offer him an extension. He's already under contract until 2022. It just It's just not feasible. I just don't think there's any way that they can afford to get Nick Foles. I don't think they can afford to give up a second. They can't afford to pay him $15 million. His total cap hit for the Jaguars is 22, but his base salary is only 15. I don't know how much of this other money would be transferred over. Beyond that, I don't even think the Jaguars can trade him, can they? They, they can't even trade him. Why are people talking about this? Dead cap this year would be $34 million. He's not getting traded, so that's not even a thing, so we don't have to worry about it. That's dumb. It would cost him $11 million to get rid of him. I'm not talking it would cost $11 million, but they would save 22 No, I'm talking about there would be a $22 million cap hit and then an additional $11 million hit on top of it to trade him. Not going to happen. So they can't get foals. The best they can do, I guess, is Dalton or Keenum. And Dalton is $17 million, so again, they would have to offer him an extension as well at 32 years old. Just hilarious. Anyways, again, wildly over time. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.